everyone. I uh, hope this uh, week has started out well for you. Thank you so much for joining us. Today we are going to dive into the fraud economy world once again. I'm saying this because uh, SIFT, the co-enabler of this webinar, has been doing a lot of research for years now into the fraudster economics, and they always share their intelligence with, with the paper's readership via webinars, something that yeah, we are very grateful for. The most interesting uh, part is that SIFT has a global data network of uh, 70 billion events per month, and they get access to the cyber underworld to, to detect the most artsy fraud tactics and to also learn what are the most effective businesses and fields. So lately, the, um, <clears throat> sorry, the payment attack fraud rate uh, has soared and um, the fraud tentacles reached out to multiple verticals in e-commerce and fintech. So yeah, things are not getting any better here. So it's about time to reassess the situation and make you aware of the new trends. And besides presenting you the, the impact of the fraud economy on the online business environment and what are the tools and technologies used by fraudsters, <clears throat> sorry, I hydrated before, but yeah. Uh, our speakers will uh, yeah, also give you some valuable tips and strategies on how to outsmart the sophisticated froster so yeah, you can stay focused on growing your business rather than constantly worrying about protecting it. But before kicking off the presentation, just some quick notes regarding housekeeping. The session will take approximately 40 minutes and we'll save some time for a Q&A session. So if you have questions yeah, for our experts, please type them in the Q&A tab on your right. And we will look at addressing as many as possible. The questions are anonymous, of course. Uh, and there is a chat room uh, where you can also engage with us or leave any comments, maybe complement the discussion with your own knowledge. And we also have a good read for you in the handouts tab. There is the latest digital trust and safety index is the first quarter edition of this year that covers some of the topics that we are about to discuss today. There is unique information there, so feel free to download it and save it for later. Now let's meet our experts. With me today are Jane Lee and Kevin Lee. They are part of the trust and safety team at SIFT, and I know that they are doing a very nice job. Uh, they have a pretty cool job, I would say. So, Jane, Kevin, welcome. Um, please introduce yourself and yeah, tell us a bit about your work. How does fraud landscape look from your side? Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, great to be here with the papers once again. Uh, my name is Kevin. I lead our trust and safety architect team here at SIFT. Uh, basically, what that means is we are the internal experts when it comes to anything and everything, risk, fraud, trust and safety related. Uh, I think we have some interesting stuff lined up for you all today to cover um, a lot of what we found in our Q1 uh, index report, uh, focusing on trust and safety and fraud, of course. Um, I've been at SIF for about five years now, and, and prior to that, led various risk and fraud and abuse teams at companies like Google, Facebook, and Square. Um, uh, pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, essentially, now what my team does is a lot of one investigations work in terms of uh, what are some new fraud patterns and trends popping up in the industry? We also consult with a lot of our existing clients on building out their strategies, knowing kind of what is out there, um, certainly within the walls, but also what is outside the walls, but uh, possibly kind of making their way in. Um, what are some strategies and ideas around how to combat that kind of malicious behavior? Um, and I'll pass it over to Jane. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everyone. It's really nice being here with you all today again. Uh, my name is Jane, and I am a trust and safety architect. Um, I've been at it for just under two years, so almost um, at my two-year anniversary. But prior to joining SIFT, I spent a little over five years at Facebook working on spam um, detection, enforcement, and measurement. And um, before that, worked on chargebacks and payments risk at Square. Um, and then prior to that, spent some time as a private investigator um, in another life, I went to go to law school, and I somehow ended up here. Um, but I've never, I've never looked back once I, I joined the the trust and safety side. So, um, hopefully, we have a bunch of uh, inf informative content for you today. Um, and yeah, I guess we can um, move on with the presentation. All right. So, uh, next slide, please. 
And if you're unfamiliar with SIFT, we are a trust and safety platform that helps businesses protect uh, certainly themselves and their consumers against various forms of fraud and abuse. And so uh, things like account takeover, uh, content abuse, spam and scams. And then we're going to focus today uh, a lot more on payment fraud. So something that's kind of maybe the grandfather of them all in terms of the, of the first type of abuse uh, that's popped up. Now, with regards to an agenda, um, first, we are going to talk about the fraud economy and kind of what that looks like and kind of define a bit of the, the roles and responsibilities, if you will, uh, different fraud trends that we've seen in uh, certainly this particular quarter in Q1 of this year. Uh, we also look at um, kind of more retroactively um, now that uh, 2021 is completed, um, what are some trends that we saw there? And then I think most importantly around mitigating exposure. So what are different companies doing to deploy um, some strategies to prevent kind of these things that they're seeing um, beyond the wall? Next slide, please. All right. Um, so uh, when we talk about the fraud economy, um, this is what we mean. And Granted, this isn't an all encompassing, if you will, uh, but we did an exercise uh, at work in terms of, hey, what are all the different ways a business can potentially be abused, taken advantage of, leveraged to maybe extract some value in a nefarious or malicious type of way? And we really broke it down into kind of three main buckets. Uh, certainly, one was around payment fraud. So the typical stealing some credit cards and then using them on your site, uh, probably creating a fake account. Um, then there's also account takeover. So let's say you have a, a known user base uh, and somebody were to uh, access those credentials and then uh, either put in some stolen credit cards or start making purchases with the existing payment instrument on file. Um, and then there's content abuse. And we see a lot about, a lot about that lately in whether it's dating sites, Jane actually did some great investigative work um, in so, some dating sites and uh, was, was published in a few different uh, news periodicals as a result um, around, hey, what are the different spam and scams that are um, happening out there in this economy um, that's really just unfortunately taking advantage of folks. And so that's a little bit of what we look at when we think about the fraud economy. And, and these are things that trust and safety teams and fraud teams have to deal with every day. Um, however, that's not the only thing that they have to deal with. So if we go to the next slide, we can look at the other things that uh, we have to contend with. And so certainly we have that fraud economy on the right hand side, but then on the left hand side, we have silo teams. And so one of the things that still somewhat astonish me, astonishes me a little bit is how dispersed we are as fraud teams where we can sit under customer support or finance, um, we might have a secure infosec or security team. Um, I've been under engineering teams leading various teams. Um, but the fact of the matter is, regardless of whatever position or where we are at in the organization, there's a pretty darn good chance that we're going to have to collaborate cross-functionally to make sure that we're able to respond to any type of events um, hitting the system. And so that's the fraud team in the middle here. Uh, and then the last section on the bottom left-hand side is around tool proliferation. So for better or for worse, we do have a lot more tools available at our disposal. Um, and that's a great thing in terms of getting a more complete picture of kind of what we're dealing with. On the not so good end is that a lot of these tools don't necessarily communicate with each other. And so in the middle here, you have the fraud team or the risk team. And our job is to essentially try and connect all these dots and really where fraud thrives and grows is in between all these cracks, between siloed teams, between different tools, um, creating a blend of kind of the fraud economy on the outside. So you have some peculiar behavior that may look a little bit abnormal, but if there's not the proper kind of gates or uh, things set up on in within the company, they can slip through and ultimately be exposed in a bad way. And so this, at least visual representation helps me visualize, okay, what are the different troubles that we potentially have to face? Who's on my team uh, to really kind of fight back? And then what are the, the challenges that um, we'll need to tackle together? Next slide, please. All right, so every quarter, SIFT uh, comes out with a trust and safety index report. 
And um, in that, we found some pretty interesting things this time around. So the number 23% um, certainly uh, uh, raised some, not alarm bells, but um, what I thought was interesting in the fact that in this fraud economy, cyber criminals leverage certainly sophisticated tools that are automated and distributed across various networks. Um, and they're simultaneously committing account takeover fraud, financial fraud, um, multi-tiered scams at really inhuman speed and scale. So basically, AKA think bot attacks here. So I'd say over the last several years, the fraud execution and the fraud um, sophistication has increased where, yeah, you have still your entry-level folks that are doing things one by one. Um, maybe they're spear phishing, so they're doing some very targeted attacks one by one. But by and large, this is a scale game where essentially their fraudsters and criminals are using their mechanical advantage, creating bots um, and, and hitting the system. Luckily, the uh, success rate still stays quite low, uh, which is good, uh, but certainly the attempts and the vectors have continued in to increase. And I think in large part, part of that is number one, the internet has grown up a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, but number two, the ways that different, like if you were to look at your app or your phone, for example, and all the different apps you have on your phone, it's not just about e-commerce anymore. It does, your phone has a lot of apps that do many, many different things that have a lot of sensitive information stored on there. And all those can be pieces of value for fraudster. And we're actually gonna take a look at some of those pieces later. Next slide, please. All right, 49%. Um, so nearly half of consumers surveyed um, said that they reported uh, or have, have fallen victim to payment fraud in the last uh, one to three years, uh, 40, 41 of which um, happened in this past year alone. Uh, and 77% had unauthorized purchases made using uh, that same payment instrument um, stored on the website or app. So to me, this screams account takeover, right? So yes, there's still the uh, scenarios where people will create fake accounts with a stolen credit card and um, attempt you know, a purchase. But I think by and large, as an industry, we've become better at spotting that type of kind of fraudulent account and then stopping them at the beginning. Um, so what happens? Well, this is a, a live ecosystem here, right? And so fraudsters adapt and they figure out, okay, maybe you're spotting my new accounts that are trying to purchase whatever items right off um, the bat here. Um, so the next level up is I'm going to try and compromise an existing user account that maybe has some good history. And then uh, maybe you'll let me get away with whatever I want to get, get away with, um, knowing that I'm coming from an existing account that has um, a potentially great history on there. Next slide. All right. Um, so we did also kind of a deep dive into here, in here and um, the index report that um, you can download as well kind of dives into this um, a bit more. Um, but for our end, we found one of the highest growth areas to be specifically in the, the fintech area. And we've seen a lot of kind of hockey stick growth um, in this particular industry over the last year or so. Um, and it's also great to see travel and hospitality making a comeback as well. Um, certainly that took a big hit over the last couple of years, but things are coming back. I'm not sure what normal will be or is at this point, uh, but uh, things are going up in a nice trajectory um, and hopefully it stays that way. Uh, but FinTech um, specifically, we broke it out into sub verticals, whether it's e-wallets, uh, cryptocurrencies and other areas, they certainly saw a significant amount of growth. Um, and to me, this just said that, hey, when it comes to the, oh, there, when it comes to making money, there's a good way to make money, there's a bad way to make money and folks uh, legitimately saw a, a great opportunity in various cryptocurrencies and NFTs and things like that. Um, that also kind of drew the eye of a lot of fraudsters as well to see if they could make a quick buck too. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to Jane. Thanks, Kevin. And, you know, I think one thing that I wanted to point out, uh, I had a conversation with a friend uh, two days ago, actually, on Sunday, and she mentioned how um, how every company is a tech company because it's tech powered. Right. And I think a very similar 
statement can be said about um, about fintech, right? Because fintech is what's powering a lot of this e-commerce, this shift to e-commerce that we've seen in the past year, especially fueled by the pandemic. Um, I think if you were like me or maybe not like me, um, you know, at the start of 2020, we saw, you know, merchants that weren't ready to go online, they were forced to go online. And it wasn't clear if they would stay like that, if consumer behavior would stay like that. But, um, you know, I, I was walking through downtown San Francisco the other day and saw how many shops were closed, right? And all these merchants, big merchants are just moving to online. And so um, I really don't see this type of um, behavior changing. And uh, yeah, I, I think these numbers are gonna are going to stay. But um, anyways, moving on to fraud. Um, I always joke, half jokingly say that uh, one of the most certain things in life is change, right? And that applies to fraud changing and evolving as well. And so here you see two, um, I don't wanna say easy types of fraud, but types of fraud that we are relatively familiar with, right? So you have fraudulent purchases. Um, these are like Kevin mentioned earlier, usually spun up by fake accounts um, that run stolen uh, payment credentials that have been obtained elsewhere. Um, we touched on bots. Um, so card testing is another one where, you know, I think um, even like seven years ago when I was at Square, you would see this in a more manual fashion, but now we are seeing this in an automated fashion. Um, and then moving on to more, uh, I, I guess, recent types of fraud that we're seeing. Um, buy now, pay later. So buy now, pay later has been the the hot topic. Um, our team is starting to travel again and attend conferences. And um, everyone wants to talk about buy now, pay later. All merchants want to explore um, accepting BNPL as an option. Um, you know, even myself as a as an online avid online shopper, I, you know, at the start of the pandemic only saw the buy now pay later option on a few merchants. Um, and that is not the story today, right? You see it almost, um, you can leverage it almost anywhere where you want to make a purchase. And so, um, like I alluded to earlier, of course, this means the fraudsters because they know the money is there. The fraudsters are also going to try to exploit these programs as well. Um, Brittany Allen, who is on our team, did some really, really amazing research. Um, she looks at Telegram forums, at the type of chatter that um, that is going on in the fraud community and the fraudster community, um, and and um, found that these bad actors were exploiting this either via account takeovers, so they were um, compromising existing accounts that had already been gone through the approval process, um, or they have been uh, using stolen credentials. So stolen identities, you know, so a um, first name, last name, uh, potentially a tax ID number, a national identifier number to get the approval for these accounts. And we'll, we'll jump into that um, in a few slides. And so, a part of my work is to test out different types of flows and find vulnerabilities or really understand where the vulnerabilities can happen. And so here I signed up for a pretty popular buy now pay later provider. And so all the way on the left, you can see I attempted to make a purchase. Um, I went through the the sign up flow that you see in the middle screenshot. Um, and then just for fun, uh, I added the third screenshot. I was ultimately declined for for this. Um, I am I have good credit per U.S. standards. Um, and so I found this to be surprising, but it kind of um illustrates how that relationship between providers and merchants still needs some some fine tuning right because i an otherwise good reputable customer got declined in this process um similarly cryptocurrency is another huge 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 topic of interest again the the conversations at conferences have been around buy now pay later and accepting crypto as payments um, and so here you see the sign up flow for overstock.com. Um, it's a big e-commerce retailer or merchant, um, and they allow you to make purchases using Bitcoin. And so here you see me going through the checkout flow, um, the purchasing or the part where you send the money, you basically have an address, a wallet, 
and you use whatever crypto wallet that you have to, to send the money over to the specified address that you see here in the center. Um, and then lastly, you get a confirmation um, here. I actually selected that I, I submitted the payment when I hadn't. I just wanted to see if it worked or not. And I got this confirmation. Uh, you can imagine the guilt I felt when I got the order confirmation and I had not sent the money. So I was uh, panicking a bit trying to figure out how, how I would explain this to um, customer service. Uh, I did about two days later get a formal cancellation notice um, from Overstock because they had not received the funds. So um, that was a, a big sigh of relief. But um, there is a point. There's a reason why I go through this entire flow. So when we talk about the traditional payments flow, so think user using a credit card, um, this is simplifying it. But this is basically, I think, where all the risks can exist, right? So of course you have ad account creation, you can have a malicious account that has a bunch of stolen, you know, credentials that they want to then run. Um, and then maybe there are existing accounts, right? Reputable accounts that uh, have a login risk. So you think the ATOs, account takeovers. Um, and so the risk there lies in the login. Um, and then of course, lastly, the the there's always the risk of the payment that you're accepting being fraudulent. But when you think about alternative payments, so when we say alternative payments, we're talking the buy now, pay laters and crypto, your entry points for risks um, at least doubles, right? Because now not only are you dealing with the fake accounts and the potential for account takeovers on your platform as a merchant, let's say, but you're also dealing with these threats that could potentially be coming in from the provider's side as well. Um, so this is a good example that that illustrates. So here you have a, a couple screenshots from a firm. Um, and I actually took these from one of my friend's accounts. She purchased a Peloton early on in the pandemic and had an Affirm account. Um, but here you can see once somebody has access, when, when they are able to successfully log into a Buy Now Pay Later account, they then have so much information on other merchants that they can now make purchases on. And as you can see here, these are pretty high value items. You see AirPods, a Roomba, um, you know, Nike, Peloton, as I mentioned. And so this is, um, again, think if I am uh, here, you see Apple listed as a merchant. Think, okay, one, you have the risk of the Apple account, um, again, being fake and or compromised. But again, on the Affirm end, um, you have the risks coming in as well. Um, Kevin and I were talking about this uh, a, a couple weeks ago where a common misconception with, uh, I, I would say, merchants is that they are protected or they are safe uh, because their provider will cover the fraud. But, um, you know, I always make the point, you do not want your your name or your brand associated with these fraud circles, because once they figure out a, a vulnerability, they will continue to exploit that until you do something to plug it up. Um, Kevin, did you have anything that I that you felt like I missed in, in from our conversation that we had? Yeah, I think these are great screenshots. Number one, um, it, it never ceases to amaze me how many fraudulent purchases or how how hot Roombas are. Uh, I'd say they're potentially more of a target than even AirPods. Um, number number two, uh, in that, um, I'd say, area of responsibility, when it comes to who ultimately is responsible for this fraud and abuse, yes, if you use a, a buy now, pay later, certainly there is the liability shift, financially speaking, and so um, you're, you're less on the hook from that end. Um, but I'd approach it also from a consumer standpoint, where when a consumer sees that charge on their credit card for $500 or $1,000 or whatever the item is. When the consumer is left with, man, what the heck do I do now? Typically who they want to blame or who they will lay blame with is not necessarily on, oh, I blame Visa or MasterCard or Affirm for letting this happen. They're going to look to the brand, whether it's a Best Buy, Roomba, Peloton, that's the name, or that's from a, even a customer service standpoint, that's who they're going to attempt to call. That's who they're going to tell their friends, like, I had fraud uh, on my account. 
they used it to buy a Roomba or a Peloton or something like that. And so from a holistic perspective, one thing to keep in mind is from a brand perspective, there is risk there and there is that there is something that you want to try and mitigate against. And so if you do uh, have some sort of alternative form of payment on your site, make sure to have a strong kind of partnership with them. Uh, number one, how is fraud dealt with? And number two, um, kind of what are the steps that they are taking to make sure that these transactions remain a safe place? Because as you can see from these screenshots, more and more, they're turning into their own kind of malls or platforms, um, which can be great as a consumer if you have an account with one of these um, BNPL firms, but all equally as nice, perhaps. Um, it's a nice place where fraudsters can more quickly get to what they want to get to as well. All right, next slide, please. So kind of in kind of preparation for this particular talk, we often look at the news, right, in terms of what's what's going on. And when we talk about the fraud economy, I'd say one of the pieces of oxygen, if you will, that helps this economy thrive is around data breaches. And even, was it last week, uh, Okta came out and said that they had a data breach. I think there was another one with TransUnion, uh, about 3 million user accounts. Um, were compromised as well. So some of these firms are quite large and you may consumers may not even know about them per se. Like people, maybe they think about Equ Equifax or TransUnion as, oh, those, those credit companies. Uh, but when they have data breaches, they are not as well known as like the, the shops that you shop at um, day to day. Because um, it's not really a shop, it's just a data aggregation um, platform. And so Yes, you have one piece that is around all these data breaches that occur. But the second big piece is that roughly two thirds of consumers share the same password across multiple different sites. And so you have a compounding effect here where it's one thing if you know one particular site had a data breach and um, maybe those credentials are available for that one site. But the fact that consumers share their credentials across multiple sites or I know Netflix, for example, is cracking down on sharing passwords across different accounts or uh, across different users. Um, it, it happens, right? And people just, people do it, unfortunately. And that, from a fraud perspective, oftentimes consumers can be the weakest link and they can be the hardest to rein in, if you will, uh, when it comes to protecting them. Next slide. And so one of the things we also took a look at is, I think these uh, screenshots are taken from Telegram just to see like what is available out there as a fraudster or a consumer in this case, trying to buy this material. And so really from left to, to right here, we're looking at things like various accounts for sale. So we mentioned account takeover being a, a very kind of profitable area just because I think a lot of businesses, they, they wanna trust their customers, right? Especially the ones that are have a good track record fraudsters know that and they try to access those accounts um, and they're only for usually a, a few dollars each and then um, so those accounts are for sale they also sell user guides so they also call them bibles and these are essentially how-to guides of how to commit fraud whether they're it's refund fraud payment fraud account takeover uh, for a particular site or for a particular uh, type of attack that the fraudster wants to kind of learn more about proof of access so these are like digital gift cards and things like that um, and also just it's almost like a menu where from accessing whether it's stolen uh, not stolen well i guess it is stolen food so um, you have a lot of food delivery companies those tend to be quite popular um, one to test credit cards and two people got to eat and so they need food and that happens to be a good area to exploit and so the the takeaway for these kind of four slides is that there are so many ways and means to access this information and the it i mean i'd say don't feel bad if you're a store listed on here because there's literally hundreds of stores listed out there um, and people are, are talking and collaborating to really find out what are the best ways to exploit um, company a b or c and um, that's why i also think it's quite important for us as a fraud and trust and safety community to collaborate where we can and share our best practices so i one of the reasons why I, I love doing kind of these webinars with folks to kind of help educate and attend different conferences now that those are coming back as well, uh, to share some of these stories because we know that from a collaboration perspective, uh, fraudsters, they don't, have, uh, they don't have any restrictions on PII, I'll tell you that. And so they can share plenty um, and we know that they're doing it. 
And I think I'll pass it back to Jane. Actually, no, I might have one more. So um, the uh, another area that people may uh, start to exploit is around identity or synthetic identity information. So the screenshots here are around, we're not attacking um, particular um, uh, businesses at the moment. Really the name of the game in this particular slide is, all right, I'm going to compile as much information I can about either one identity or multiple different identities and construct a synthetic one that looks like a pretty darn good fake account at the end of the day. Um, and then you can try and verify some of this information as well with different sites. Um, and it's really, the, the tools are out there, the systems are out there um, and the scale is out there. So there's enough people at least talking about this stuff um, to make a meaningful impact uh, from our perspective. So now I think I can pass it back to Jane. Thanks. Um, yeah, and you know, I think again, just to bring up Brittany, who's amazing on our team, she, I like how she um, phrased it. She said, are you verifying the identity or an identity? Um, and, you know, kind of to piece everything together, um, what we can think of each data breach is, is a piece to the puzzle, right? Or each phishing campaign is a piece to the puzzle. Um, and of course, what these bad actors are doing is they're compiling a database. So they have a full profile on Jane Lee. And you can see that here in the, the third screenshot where someone's um, very, very personal information is available for sale. Um, these are strategies that they are selling to, um, to steal tax returns. Um, it's tax season here in the US. And I actually have, um, actually same friend whose screenshots I got the Affirm um, access to her sister-in-law um, tried to file her returns this year and was told that they had already been filed for her. And so it's, it hits very close to home and it, um, it impacts more people in your network than, than you, you would think. Um, one other thing that I want to call out in the previous slide, when they, these bad actors are selling their usage guides, that particular screenshot was how to exploit, well, there was a particular vulnerability with two FAs going to Yahoo Mails and AOL um, email addresses. And so they are continuously stress testing different systems to really figure out what they can get away with. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a perfect segue into this um, recent headline that we've seen, but um, credential stuffing is on the rise. Uh, and this, um, I would say is pretty vertical agnostic. It doesn't really matter um, which industry, um, I, I would say across the board in conversations that I'm having, people are seeing credential stuffing. And of course, these are automated attacks where um, they're using script, scripts to, to test a batch of username and password combinations. Um, and this starts to really um, make obvious the importance of technology, right? Because the bad actors, the fraudsters are using technology, right? And so we we have to kind of match that and use the right type of technology as well. Um, what we do see with credential stuffing attacks that make them especially dangerous is that they don't always result in a downstream event. So you can have an account that had a bunch of su successful logins, as you see here, but they don't necessarily have a purchase that is made at that point. Of course, this is because what the person, um, unauthorized person is trying to do here is just test to see if they can get in. Um, and then this information will later be then sold on the dark web or it'll be used at a later time to, to, to make a, a purchase. Um, and so what we are seeing is sleeper accounts. So uh, accounts that were part of credential stuffing uh, back in 2020 that are now showing up to make the purchases um, you know, as, as far as a year later. And so I think Kevin and I have been drilling this enough, but what we're seeing now is just the blending of different fraud types. So it's not just um, a stolen credit card you're dealing with anymore. It's not just a fake account that you're dealing with anymore. It is a legitimate account that is being compromised to then commit credential or to then be used for credential stuffing. And so, you know, we think about that fraud economy image that we shared in the beginning, the, the problem has pretty much exploded for us and our scope has is much, is much greater at this point. Um, and so here are some three, uh, here are three um, different fraud 
uh, how do I say it? fraud rings that we uncovered at SIFT in our latest reports. And so the first one that um, is mentioned here, pig butchering, is one that I personally worked on. Um, and it is, as Kevin mentioned, it's where bad actors are using dating apps. So they're committing content fraud initially, right, to, to lure in their victims. Um, and they later take them off platform um, onto these fake crypto trading websites to then try to get them to send money over to um, to the fraudster's wallet. And so um, there you see, again, fake accounts, content fraud. Um, and then I don't even know what we want to call the, the fake trading platform type type of fraud. But um, again, making things a lot more complicated for one person or one platform to be able to detect um proxy phantom is another one i think we shared in our last our previous report um but they are getting a lot more sophisticated when it comes to even ip addresses right and emulating ip addresses and this is actually one thing that i noticed with the pig butchering scammers they know certain ip ranges um that belong to specific organizations so what they do then is they use emulators to look like, hey, um, Jane is using a uh, Verizon is a very common uh, popular mobile network here um, to look as if they are based in the US, based in California, um, you know, using a, a Verizon IP. All right. So what does all this essentially lead to? And so we've talked a lot about account takeovers and chargebacks and things like that. Um, all these kind of bullets should have some sort of KPI associated with them. Um, but the, the two highlighted on here for this particular conversation are specifically around negative PR and brand reputation. And those can be harder to measure, certainly. Um, if you have a customer success team, they potentially measure something called net promoter score or NPS score. Um, that can get um, towards some things like uh, brand reputation and really how that can be damaged from uh, a fraud attack or a data breach or something like that. Um, and then also in, around negative PR where the and your customer success team probably has these stories as well, where if you check the, the Twitter feed or customer success, uh, like emails that are coming in or chats, um, where there's just, there can be anyways, a lot of swirl especially when customers, more so than ever, or even prospects or potential customers, uh, they don't necessarily have to talk directly to the business anymore. They can go to different forums and talk to each other and see what their experiences were. And sometimes, especially for bigger companies uh, that have teams that monitor this chatter, this talk, there can be a lot of kind of negative swirl out there regarding a business to potentially no fault of their own or it's ancillary. Uh, but it's certainly something that I see larger organizations pay more attention to. And so uh, if you don't already, I'd recommend having a conversation with your customer support or customer success team around, hey, what does it look like from a fraud perspective? Or do we look at these different areas to better understand what the experience is? Because there is, I believe, a negative majority out there or a silent majority, if you will, that choose to never contact the business directly but we'll certainly tell their friends and go to different forums to talk about their experiences. Maybe they leave some sort of review or rating or something like that. Um, and that's really uh, where I think a lot of focus goes because it it is certainly difficult to acquire new customers um, and retain them too. But uh, when it comes to this type of area, it can really poison the well, if you will, um, if there's a lot of that on the particular um, platform. Next slide, please. All right, so when it comes to mitigation at scale, like what are the different tools and techniques that teams are deploying out there? And um, I, I use this particular slide quite a lot and it, it's, it, uh, to me, it still remains true. Like regardless of if you are building a team or tools in-house or you're using third-party tools or maybe you have some sort of hybrid, you're going to have to have some combination of all of these things, all the way from kind of at the base layer, I'd say the most important one is around high volume digestible data ingestion. I know that's a long, long phrase, but really essentially what that means is having access to your own data and being able to kind of do some interesting things off of it. And it goes all the way up to eventually uh, reporting where when you're talking to different cross-functional stakeholders, or let's say you, you manage a team, how, 
how are we doing today versus last month versus last year? All these things are important ingredients to having a strong posture when it comes to trust and safety. And I think Jane will kind of dive into a couple kind of layers here in a moment. Thanks, and I am here to drive it home. Um, so we're going to be focusing on machine learning and um, and the automation piece. Why? Because we've talked a lot about how technologically sophisticated um, these bad actors are coming are becoming. Um, so really focusing on those two main points to to help teams scale. Right when it comes to it, doesn't make sense. I don't know any company, even Facebook, right, where it's you have a one to one person dealing with a problem. Right, you want to be able to um, get the biggest bang for your buck with um, a team that makes sense. And so um, Kevin talked about the high volume of digestible data uh, that that companies have as passive data, right? And this often just comes from you um, having a website. There's so much metadata there, thousands of different data points that um, that you can use or put into the, uh, apply the right algorithms to, to make an assessment. And so what you're seeing here um, is what we do at SIFT or how our SIFT engine is powered. Um, you have the, again, the various data points here, things like identity, behavioral patterns, um, and then what we ultimately do is we analyze those and then spit out a risk assessment. And so here you see something scoring um, 99, which uh, our score goes from a zero to 100, 100 being the riskiest, zero being the least riskiest. Um, and we'll kind of dissect, you know, what are some things that can go into this, this score of 99. Um, one thing I do want to call it, the, the behavior um, analysis that we do. I think one of the most interesting ones that I have heard of um, is, you know, if if a phone is plugged into a charger and how long it's plugged into a charger, is, is it just staying plugged in? Um, of course, I think everyone has seen that meme of a click farm, right, where you just see hundreds of phones and people are uh, paid to go and tap, 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 right? And so, um, you know, in certain situations, that can be a risky signal. If you see a lot of taps coming from a phone that's just been charged for a week straight. Um, so going back to the 99, um, here are some uh, examples of data points that, that we are looking at to that contribute to a score. And so you have things like different login locations, um, IP address analysis, is this user using a VPN or proxy? Um, again, it's not a entirely bad signal, but it does bump that up a little bit. Um, things like um, velocity of logins, um, you, you know, and I think we look at, it's a little over 16,000 different um, data points, um, some of which you do see here to really factor in into how we, how we make an assessment. And then lastly, um, talking about workflow and rules automation. Again, it's not it's impossible to ask uh, a, a trust and safety team to scale without automation. Um, and so here, a way that we do it again at SIFT is if you think about that score of 99, um, I would say that's a pretty risky score. Um, you know, perhaps you don't even want your teams to bother looking at them because you have high enough confidence that these are a bunch of fake accounts or nefarious actors. Um, and so at that point, you might just then um, all the way on the right side, you see a rule that says, we're going to just say this, this session is bad. Um, we're not even going to look at the user. But of course, there's always the gray area, right? And I think that's where a lot of fraud teams exist in today, that gray area where you're not sure. And so say, um, you know, in the score ranges of 50 to, or sorry, uh, like 30 to 70, um, it, which is the mid range on the zero to mid range on the zero to hundred scale. Um, at that point, maybe you want to throw some friction. We talk about dynamic friction a lot. Um, applying different levels of friction based on that risk assessment, and so um, you might have a passive notification that you send to someone's email, just saying, "Hey, we noticed this login coming from uh, I don't know." Uh, the Netherlands, right? When I'm based in in San Francisco, um, maybe at that point you just want to let the user know, hey, we detected this, and the user could then either choose to confirm that that was them 
or, or just ignore it if that was in fact them. Um, but if it's, let's say, something a little more riskier, right? So maybe a riskier location or um, maybe also a new device coming from a new country. At that point, maybe uh, you, you might feel confident that, hey, there's a good chance that this user is compromised. Also a good chance that they're traveling for work and using another uh, another device. And so at that point, maybe you want to send a 2FA or a MFA type of verification. And so really giving teams the flexibility to apply uh, flexible types of friction um, based on their own risk tolerance, risk assessment is what we really advocate for at SIFT. Um, with that, I think that is all in terms of content that we had. Kevin, did you have any um, last comments to, to say on this? Um, no, I think I'm good on my end. I think then we can um, open it up for questions. And I'll pass it back to you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Kevin, for uh, for all these insights. Uh, yeah. Just be uh, before starting with the with the Q and A session, I also have uh, something to add. It's uh, yeah, short story or an anecdote. I don't know exactly how to to call it. Uh, so um, it's more for the for the audience. <clears throat> Uh, and so I had uh, an interview with Jane. It was just published uh, on the papers today. Uh, yeah, and there Jane goes uh, very much in depth with all this thing that she just discussed now. Uh, so I, uh, I naively asked her, uh, what about the metaverse? I mean, uh, probably the metaverse will be added to these all these dimensions and verticals. And yeah, the spoiler alert, it has already started. So, which was a bit surprising for me because I said, okay, Metaverse is just in a, some sort of an incipient stage. So uh, talking about fraud in the Metaverse was like, yeah, speaking about a problem that doesn't exist. However, it does. So um, yeah, just as a comment on my end, I believe that, uh, yeah, probably in the next index or next year, <laughs> uh, we'll have some, uh, yeah, Unfortunately, probably some some insights into fraud in the metaverse and yeah NFTs as well. All right, so now uh, let's uh, let's take a couple of questions from the audience. Okay, there is one. Uh, have you seen any link between malicious app leading to banking or shopping fraud? Well, I'll let you two fight over it because there is no name uh, mentioned here. So who would like to take it? I think I'm I'm unmuted, so I can. Take a crack at it. So malicious links between banking and shopping uh, sites, was that? I think the, so the, the short answer there is absolutely. Yeah, I mean, shopping or shopping fraud. Yeah, uh, we do see a lot of correlation. Uh, certainly, right, I'd say the fraud economy is connected, right? There's certain fibers of that economy that are tighter than others. And one area that comes to mind is digital banking and like, of course, like different shopping sites and things like that, where I'd say digital banking and digital goods, if I had to be really specific, where uh, from a fraud standpoint, you're looking at value extraction. And the best way to do that is if there is a digital bank account or an e-wallet that I can, as a fraudster, connect with and, and tap to see if there's existing value on there. What's the fastest way for me to, to flip it? Maybe I have to go through some middlemen to like set up my scripts and to do it in a, a, a really automated way. But if I am able to find one account that has, let's say, several thousands of dollars, what's the best way for me to flip it or test it? Um, a digital, um, uh, an e-commerce site with digital goods tends to be a, a great vector. Um, we do see a lot in the iGaming space or gambling space as well. Um, that can be associated with more like money laundering and, and, and things like that. Um, but that certainly tends to be a strong connection uh, between, uh, let's say, a e-wallet or digital bank account and then essentially a, a extraction avenue. OK, thank you, Kevin. OK, here's one for Jane. It's also a favorite topic of mine. So you mentioned alternative payment methods like buy now, pay later, and even cryptocurrencies. Why are these getting so much focus from frosters right now? Yeah, and that, uh, that's because the money's there, right? And it's it's where merchants are exploring. They're the new and emerging types of, of payments. And so the fraud goes where the money goes. 
Um, we saw this in 2020 as you know everything moved digital. We um, and so one, I think just because that's what the direction things are moving in, um, and two, I think because the process is still it, it's being fine tuned, right? And so they know this. They knew it's a newer thing for merchants, and so um, really just. Um, hitting people where it hurts, I think, as they figure it out, is is they're they're ruthless, and so I would say those are the two um, two factors. I think also cryptocurrencies, right? When they get a payout, it's it's really immediate for the fraudsters, and so I think um, okay, maybe they hack into a crypto wallet and then send money to uh, an address that they own, right? Once that money's sent, it's sent, and that's the the. The beauty, as well as kind of the downside, when it comes to cryptocurrency and from a fraud perspective, right? And so that's why I do see crypto. You know, we see this even on Telegram and the dark dark web. Um, crypto is the preferred; it is the required um, type of payment, um, and so I think that's why it's so so popular. Yeah, makes sense. One other thing to add there is, in addition to buy now, pay later, I'll throw in like. Uh, click and collect or um, buy online pickup in store. One of the reasons why they're becoming more exploited is because they are newer areas. So if you think of a company, the policies and procedures, the different rules or, or models that are put in place, they may have not been put in place yet. So certainly if you rewind a couple of years ago where a lot of physical stores had to shut down and online was the only lifeline but if there wasn't really a strong online presence or if there's a way that you can still kind of go to the store and you know, they can come out and deliver the, the packages to uh, your car, that's another way that these brick and mortar businesses can stay in business. So they were absolutely rushing to do this just to stay afloat and stay alive. But as a result of that, many of these companies didn't have the same rigorous policies and procedures in place or models in place or rules in place. And so that led kind of really open season or the, the door was open uh, for different types of exploitation to occur. Okay. Okay, we'll take one more and then I will take you home. Uh, so uh, how can we reduce fraud without imposing a significant increase in friction in the user experience or deterring legitimate customers? Kevin, can you take this one? Uh, yeah, sure. I think to me it comes down to simply enabling the 99%. So what are you doing as a business to enable the 99 plus percent of good users on your platform that really just want to engage and purchase your your products? And how do you get to that point? And Jane mentioned a little bit earlier around dynamic friction. And to me, that separates, I'd say the professional kind of, uh, kind of teams that are out there like really that are pretty darn sophisticated, who are essentially building a product that is, I'll call it trust and safety by design, where they're, in, they're able to do things like remove the CVV or have express checkout uh, for these users or enable instant payments. That's a tricky business. Like, of course, I'd love to get my payment in, you know, instantly or the, the next day. But from a financial standpoint, it, it leaves a lot of exposure. And how do we protect ourselves? And so it, the trick or the the, the strategy there is really enabling that kind of vast majority of users on the platform that really want to engage while still kind of keeping kind of the, the right gates in check to make sure that the sub 1% of the population that is malicious, um, who can do an outsized kind of uh, amount of damage on the platform, stay in check. And so it I've seen areas where conversions go up because of the fraud team. It is rare. But the reason why it can happen is because the fraud teams or the trust and safety teams approach it differently where it's not just about stopping fraud. It's how do we make the, the experience for the 99% as seamless as possible. And it absolutely can be done. Well, that's very good to know because I know that there is uh, yeah, a huge challenge with this balance uh, protection and conversion or protection and seamless customer experience. All right, so uh, thank you all for your questions. We are about to, to wrap it up now. Uh, Kevin, Jane, it was a great pleasure to, to host this uh, webinar together with you. Thank you all for your time and uh, we will send you all uh, a link to, uh, to the webinar. 
and we will get back to the questions that we did not have time to include in the session. Yeah, please feel free to reach out to uh, Jane and Kevin for more insights, and you can also check out SIP resources section on their website for more educational webinars like this one. Wishing you all a very good day and a productive week ahead. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.